winter in the Scottish Highlands. There is no comfort in these unsparing hills. The wind is merciless, the cold cruel. For six months of the year, the high tops are buried in snow. Yet even here, in dead of winter, there is life. To survive, mountain wildlife must be tough and adaptable. Food is hard to come by, and here the climate can be as hostile as any place on earth. Few birds can withstand such bitter weather. Wearing white for winter, essential camouflage in eagle country, only the ptarmigan seems truly at home. With feathers puffed up against the cold, it scratches a living from beneath the snow. A hungry buzzard feasts on carrion. For such predators, scavenging is a way of life. Without it, neither buzzard nor eagle could survive. This, then, is the lonely world of the high tops and the wild creatures who live there, the hunted and the hunters in the hills where eagles fly. Ice holds the land in a grip of iron, but every new day the sun edges a little higher above the hills. The hard weather cannot go on forever. Day by day, drip by drip, winter's grasp is slowly slipping. As the thaw continues, the drips become a trickle. The trickle becomes a torrent, and soon the glens echo to the roar of meltwater. This is not the end of winter but it is the first hint of coming spring.
Dawn finds the golden eagle at its nest, for the birds are resident through the winter, and the eagle's year begins early. This pair has returned to the same cliff where they bred last year. Now nest building is the most urgent task. There is no mistaking that imperious stare, or the sleek mane whose colour gives these magnificent birds their name, golden eagles. No wonder Scotland is proud of them. And with over 400 breeding pairs, the Scottish population is one of the largest and most important in Europe. The golden eagle is Britain's biggest native bird of prey. From bill to tail, it can measure up to a metre in length, and every centimetre conveys an impression of craggy strength. The wingspan exceeds the height of most tall men, enabling the eagle to sail far and wide over the huge areas of its home range with the minimum of effort. On the ground, it can appear awkward and ungainly, but flight transforms the golden eagle into a creature of matchless, soaring grace. All through February and into March, the birds are busy. A steady airlift of sticks and stems, adding to the growing pile on the cliff ledge. Over the years, if the same eyrie is used regularly, the nest can grow to a huge size. A cartload of kindling may be four feet high. But that depends on how much timber is available. Where pine is plentiful, the nest will be generous. But in the treeless wastes of the far north and west, It'll be a more modest affair. Foraging for heather and other material is a task which both birds share. But the bulk of the building is done by the female. Later, when the nest is nearing completion, the birds will hunt around for wood rush to line the cup in which the eggs will soon be laid. Golden eagles are conservative birds. Not only do they mate for life, but they remain faithful to their ancestral eyries. Some sites are undoubtedly centuries old, strongholds used by generations of eagles. Yet most pairs will have at least one alternative site, which they may use from time to time, while other birds may have as many as eight or more nests within their home range. But most pairs seem to have a favourite site, and this bird has returned to hers. It is now mid-March. Already the first egg has been laid. The long, slow process of incubation has begun. The following weeks are critical for the eagles. At no other time are they so vulnerable to human disturbance. Every year, vast tracts of moorland go up in smoke. The heather is burnt deliberately to encourage new growth, tender young shoots for the grouse to feed on, and fresh grass for deer and sheep. Such fires in themselves are seldom a threat to eagle eyries, but the birds are all too easily disturbed. The dense, drifting smoke and the presence of people too close to the nest could be enough to cause them to desert. This time the fire comes close, but all is well, and there are now two eggs in the nest. When the smoke has dispersed,
the female returns to resume the vital task of incubation. Early spring, and the sheep are brought down from the hill for the lambing. The sheep are gathered just in time, for March in the highlands can be treacherous. A shift of the wind brings a return to winter, and a new hazard for the eagles. But the birds are used to these sudden snowstorms. Unless she's buried, the female will sit tight and see the blizzard through. Yet even on the high ground, the snow cannot last forever. And the ptarmigan's changing plumage is a sure sign of warmer days to come. So the long wait continues. And as the time for hatching draws nearer, the female sits tighter than ever. By mid-April, the snow is going fast. Already the mountain hares are beginning to lose their white coats as the mountain slopes shed theirs. Everywhere, new life is appearing. For this newborn lamb, the chance of being killed by a hungry eagle is remote. A few eagles will occasionally take lambs, it is true. But the great majority are picked up as carrion, killed by disease, starvation, or even the cold, but not by eagles. Six weeks have passed since the first egg was laid, and a special event has just taken place at the Eyrie. But the eels are not alone in producing young. The wheat ear, one of the first returning migrants, also has a family to feed. Back at the Ari, the second egg has hatched and a desperate struggle for survival has begun. Nobody knows why this aggression takes place, but eight times out of ten, the younger chick is killed. At this time in the life of the Ari, it is the male that is doing all the hunting for the family. For the first two or three weeks of their lives, the female keeps a close watch on the young chicks and spends most of her time looking after them.
At feeding time, she's in constant attendance, offering small titbits to the youngsters and helping herself to the larger, coarser morsels. Ptarmigan, stoat, fox cub, the male continues to bring a steady supply of food to the Ari. The young chicks grow fast. In their first two weeks, their weight will have doubled, and three weeks after that, their birth weight will have been multiplied 32 times over. Although only a couple of days separate the two chicks, the difference in age could be crucial for the younger one. Being the firstborn is a definite advantage, and the elder chick, being heavier and stronger, is able to grab more food than its sibling. But if the weaker chick is not killed in these first three weeks, its chances of survival increase dramatically. For so powerful a bird, the female is a most gentle mother. With painstaking care, she curls her sharp talons so as not to injure her precious youngsters. Not all golden eagles nest on cliffs. A neighbouring pair chose a Scots pine, but already one of their chicks has died, almost certainly killed by its elder brother or sister. The pines are relics from the past from the great wood of Caledon, the vast primeval northern forest which once covered three million acres of Scotland. Today, only fragments of the old Caledonian forest remain. But wherever the native pines still thrive, there too you may find other unusual survivors. The Scottish crossbill, now classified as a distinct species in its own right, is a typical resident of the Caledonian forest. That secateur beak is the perfect tool for the collection and wrenching apart of pine cones to get at the seeds which are the crossbill's major source of food. As the male returns with a full crop, his bright reddish colouring stands out against the greenery. Both birds feed regurgitated seeds to their hungry brood, 
whose appetite seems inexhaustible. Before they leave the nest, these youngsters may consume as many as 85,000 seeds. In another part of the eagle's domain, a pair of merlins have commandeered an old hooded crow's nest to raise their young. Merlins are Britain's smallest birds of prey. The male is scarcely bigger than a blackbird. Yet these fierce little falcons are more than ready to defend their nesting territory against any intruder, however powerful. As the eagle sails overhead, the merlin leaves the nest to join its mate. And together they see him off, making up in aggression what they lack in size. Only when the eagle has been driven away will the merlin return to preen its ruffled feathers before settling down at the nest once more. Like all birds of prey, Golden eagles regularly suffer the indignity of being mobbed by species smaller and less powerful than themselves. Such behaviour is extremely effective in deterring a hunting predator and drawing unwelcome attention to its presence. The boldest culprits are the hooded crows. The bird they're mobbing here is an immature eagle which has strayed into the home range of the resident breeding pair. Meanwhile, the youngsters in the area are getting bigger every day. The first soft coat of fluffy down has been replaced by a second thicker layer and they are now old enough to be left alone, though the female still remains close at hand while the male is scouring the glens for food. When eagles are hunting, the red grouse lies low. For mother and chicks, camouflage is the best defence. Only when the danger has passed does the hen lead her family from cover and begin to feed again. In Scotland, the red grouse is a famous sporting bird. Grouse shooting is big business, and some keepers do not take kindly to seeing their precious birds ending up as food for eagles. But careful research has proved beyond doubt that the taking of grouse by golden eagles does not affect the sportsman's bag. In a normal year, there are more than enough grouse for both the eagles and the guns. 
When grass numbers are low, this is the result of bad weather or other factors and has nothing to do with predators. It is now seven weeks since the hatch. Somehow, against the odds, the younger eaglet has managed to survive those first critical days and is growing as lustily as his brother. Both youngsters are beginning to look like young eagles. Already the first feathers are sprouting through their coats of down. When prey is brought to the nest, they can feed themselves, and the female no longer needs to spend so much time with them. Bones and other indigestible bits are removed by the female, otherwise the youngsters might choke. But the time when they can join their parents in the air is still a long way off. Even though the eaglets are now more than half grown, the parents still bring sprigs of green pine to embellish the nest. Why they do so is a mystery. Perhaps the fresh greenery helps to cover up the telltale remains of earlier kills. As spring turns to summer, another source of food appears, when the red deer produce their calves. Marauding eagles hold no fear for this adult hind. But for newborn calves, it's another matter. Left unguarded even for a little while, they are at risk. Hidden in the heather, they may be safe, but as soon as they move, they are easy meat unless their mothers return for the eagle's world is a harsh one. There is no room for sentiment in these hungry hills. Yet when summer comes, even the wildest mountain can become a place of unexpected beauty. High summer, and a hen harrier sails past on an endless hunt for food. Like the golden eagles whose uplands they share, the harriers also have a family, but they have four mouths to feed. Forty years ago, this would have been a rare sight indeed. Driven from the mainland by egg thieves and grouse moor keepers, the birds clung on only in Orkney and the Hebrides. But fewer keepers and more young conifer plantations have enabled the hen harrier to recolonize many of its former haunts.
Hen harriers are ground nesting birds. And this female has chosen a typical site in deep heather to raise her brood. With twice as many young as the neighbouring eagles, competition for food is fierce. And when family squabbles break out, the nest becomes a rough house, with no holds barred. The difference in age between these two youngsters is quite marked, yet despite their rivalries, few nestlings are killed. The young harriers grow fast. Soon, when they're just over a month old, they will make their first flight. For the young eagles, too, the time has come when they must leave the eyrie, which has been their home and their refuge for the past ten weeks. For a month now, the female has taken to rejoining her mate on his daily hunting forays, leaving the eaglets to their own devices. The female watches from a nearby tree as the youngsters become more adventurous. At this stage, the older of the two seems the more vigorous. Wing flapping toughens the muscles for the moment of truth which is now very close. A few more flaps. And he's away. On the ground, the youngster has the shuffling gait of an old man. He won't take off again for a while. Within a few weeks, he'll be flying strongly with his parents. But wherever he goes, they will continue to bring food for another two or three months. Meanwhile, the second eaglet has yet to fly. The parents seem anxious and stay close, 
as if they can sense what is about to happen. Another first flight is completed, and the Ayre, for so long the centre of the eagle's world, is empty, and summer moves on. The peaty waters of the hill lochens echo to the strange cries of red-throated divers. Here, long after the young eagles have flown, the divers are still awaiting the arrival of their young. In the glens, the heather blooms, signalling the end of summer. And the two young eagles are now aloft for longer periods, as if revelling in the sheer joy of flight. September finds them still together, and they'll remain with their parents well into the winter, seeking to perfect their skills as hunters and masters of the skies. Autumn comes with a clatter of hooves as the deer stalkers head for the hills. Deer stalking, like grass shooting, is important to Scotland. But why not leave the deer in peace? One answer is that with over 200,000 red deer roaming the highlands, their numbers must be controlled in order to maintain a healthy population. Selective shooting with a high-powered rifle is probably the most humane way of doing the job. Stalking also brings a rich, if gruesome, harvest for the eagle. Every stag that falls to the guns will be opened up and the grelock, the beast's entrails, left on the hill for the scavengers.
The snow returns. The days grow shorter. The year has turned full circle. Once more, the falls are freezing fast, as if the summer had never been. The deer go hungry, and hills where wild orchids bloomed are fit only for snow buntings. Now hunting is harder for the predators. In the lean, cold months to come, every day will be a treadmill of endless patrolling in search of prey. But the eagle's patience is infinite. This time he misses, but there'll be other kills, other feasts, and as the freeze continues, no shortage of carrion. In winter, scavenging is a way of life. Dead animals like this red deer calf may provide the eagle with up to 40% of its diet. But a reliance on carrion renders the eagle especially vulnerable to those who still regard all birds of prey as vermin. Old attitudes are slow to change, and a carcass laced with poison will kill an eagle just as surely as a bullet. It is, of course, against the law, but poison baits are still put out, and eagles continue to die. A sad end for a splendid bird. At a time when wilderness is everywhere in retreat, it's reassuring to know that even in Britain there are still wild places in the high corries and the great sad hills where eagles fly. such places more than ever. It would be an emptier world without the presence of this indomitable bird.
O oh bird, that somewhere yonder sings, in the dim hour twixt dreams and dawn, lone in the hush of sleeping things, in some sky sanctuary withdrawn, your perfect song is too like pain, and will not let me sleep again. Now the slow light fills all the trees, the world before so still and strange, with day's familiar presences, back to its common self must change, and little gossip shapes of song, the porches of the morning throng. Hear how the bushes echo. By my life, these birds have joyful thoughts. Think you they sing like poets from the vanity of song? Or have they any sense of what they sing? The rich dawn chorus of another spring morning heralds the coming of day. Have birds any sense of what they sing? What is its purpose? Through the ages, bird song has attracted the attention of poet and ornithologist alike. A male blackcap carefully chooses song posts in his territory, and from these he sings loud and clear. The language of birds is complex, made up as it is of songs and calls, signals, displays, postures and gestures. To human ears and eyes, it's a foreign language, and we must interpret if we're to understand. By singing, the male bird is advertising. He's hoping to attract a mate, or if he already has one, his song helps to strengthen the bond between them and synchronizes their sexual rhythms. But to another male, a different message is clear. This territory is occupied. Keep out or be attacked.
Song helps the bird watcher to identify the species. It helps the birds too. Important where appearances are as similar as the willow warbler. And the chiff chaff. To songbirds that nest among scrub, a loud voice is all important, for the message must carry through these dense surroundings. The grasshopper warbler turns his head from side to side to spread his message as far as possible. Occasionally he pauses and listens for the song of an intruder or to locate the position of a rival neighbour. For its size, the wren has the loudest voice in the business, and he too pauses to listen. That intruder must be sent packing. Reed beds are also dense habitats, and in spring resound to the churring and clinking songs of reed warblers. Like most birds that live in thick vegetation, reed warblers lack brightly coloured plumage. Bright colours wouldn't show up through the jungle of reeds, so song is the chief means of communication. The sedge warbler has a more varied song. He often mimics others, as if unable to think of sufficient variations of his own. No songbird this. The bittern's boom, like a distant foghorn, carries for a mile or more. He draws close to a colony of black-headed gulls. Cautiously, he stalks through the wet vegetation in search of a meal. Much to the displeasure of his neighbours, who fear that their newly hatched chicks would make a tasty snack. Raucous cries convey their annoyance, and they see the bitten off with swooping mock attacks. Perhaps they were surprised to see him, for bitterns seldom come into such open surroundings in broad daylight. The plumage of this rare bird is much more suited to concealing his presence in a deep cover of reeds. Sound is not the only language used by birds. They also use sign language. And as if to make the point, the bittern threatens a coot by puffing out his head feathers to exaggerate his size and appear more menacing. 
Sign language is particularly used by those that live in open habitats. Avocets have striking black and white markings. A pair bob and feed side by side. And resent the interruption of their courtship by another. But perhaps he was only playing gooseberry. The drake mallard has an extrovert courtship plumage, but the duck is far more drab, well camouflaged for sitting on the nest. With shell ducks, the plumage of the sexes is similar. Neck stretching and bill tossing signify aggression. and the male's bill is exaggerated with a large red knob at its base. A Canada goose makes use of its brilliant white cheek patches in a series of display postures. With head held low, the threat is very apparent. But the patches are also used in a triumphant head-tossing display. And there it is again. The chocolate brown mask of the black-headed gull is a symbol of aggression. Rivals threaten each other, head held low, exaggerating the mask. But when a paired couple meet, the frightening mask is turned away, and the white nape of the neck displayed in an act of appeasement. To strengthen the bond between them, the male courtship feeds his partner. She begs like a chick, and accepts the offering. The avian equivalent of a box of chocolates. Sandwich terns nest in colonies and erect their black crests and fence with dagger-like bills to defend a territory hardly bigger than the nest in this crowded bird city. Courtship feeding is important here too. If he can find her, that is. Perhaps she just got tired of waiting. It's not very often that birds actually come to blows, for their language usually conveys the message before they reach that stage. But a really determined intruder may stand his ground, and then a fight is inevitable. Moorhens lock claws in vicious combat. A little assistance from the missus is always welcome, and up she comes in support. This she signals by flashing her white tail feathers. And it works. The rival beats a hasty retreat. The end product of all these activities is starting a family, and the nest must be built in readiness.
the great crested grebes are still courting, with mutual spreading of head ornaments and shaking of bills. Unfortunately, these symbols also trigger off feelings of aggression, and to overcome these, they turn their heads away and habit preen, a displacement activity rather akin to a man in a tense situation straightening his tie. Trespassing coots soon get the message and retreat from the threat of the grebe's bill. And the mutual head shaking and habit preening continues. With species such as the ruff, the males are promiscuous and take no part in nesting. The reeves are attracted to the traditional display ground, or lek, by the jousting of the ruffs. The crouching female reveals white patches at the base of the tail, which urge the males to display more strongly. In the true spirit of male chauvinism, the ruffs are adorned with coloured neck feathers. In silence, they display and fight for the most favourable positions or courts in the lek. Usually, those with coloured ruffs are dominant over the white. A dominant ruff may tolerate several of these satellite males in his court, for they help to attract the females. The reeve enters the court, crouches, and copulation takes place. Occasionally, a satellite male is successful. A rough leck is one of the most fascinating sights of the bird world. causing this coot to get overexcited. Nests have been built, eggs are laid and tended with the utmost care. The grebe hears minute sounds from the developing chick within the egg, an important clue to the date of hatching. The pair bond must be carefully maintained during incubation, and the moorhens indulge in affectionate mutual caressing and preening. The coots are still making trouble, this time for a little greed. But now they have responsibilities of their own. The chicks constantly demand food. They lack the white head shield of their parents, for in coots this triggers aggression. Instead, the chicks have red head patches, which stimulate the parents in their constant search for food. The mallards hear the patter of tiny webbed feet. Imprinted on mum as their leader from the moment they hatch, they follow her everywhere. The coots take a brief rest from all that feeding and snatch the opportunity for a family preening session. Happy events have occurred for the moorhens as well. And now the function of that yellow tip to the adult's bill becomes apparent. By pecking at this spot, 
chicks stimulate the parental urge to feed them. Brooding is important too. A bearded tit collects grubs for a hungry brood. The chicks have colourful gapes with a pattern of spots. To the parents, those mouths must seem like bottomless pits. The colourful gapes are used to advantage by the chicks of most songbirds to gain the attention of parents. And this includes the wren. The gape and the pleading calls spur the parents on to even greater efforts in their search for food. Similarly with the song thrush. The stronger the chick, the wider it gapes. The adult is cautious. In the interests of safety, the faecal sac is removed, as it could have attracted a predator. Talking of predators, the instinctive reaction of small birds is to spread the word that danger is nearby. The incessant clatter of alarm notes as the predator is mobbed tells others where it is. And everyone gets in on the act. Another strategy employed, especially by ground nesting birds, is distraction by feigning injury. The avocet makes good use of the broken wing trick, luring the predator to a safe distance from the nest. Birds of a feather flock together, and this is certainly true of migrating geese. Flock unity is important, and their musical honking keeps all the skein in touch as they follow the white tail of the one in front. flocks of waders, each species possessing their own distinctive calls and markings on wing or tail. A blizzard of wings to confuse the predator. Instant communication and response which enables the flock to twist and turn together. Pure perfection in mass communication. And who can fail to be stirred by the sight of the familiar starlings when massed in their thousands? Mark them. In the air, the starlings, before they roost, at their evolutions. Scores of starlings, wheeling, streaming and twisting, the whole murmuration turning like one bird. Soul singer in the world of dreams, where voice, out ringing loud and far into the empty darkness, seems an echo from a distant star. Thou comest, as God's angels will, when day and all its noisier mirth, gone past us like the wind, are still, the stars in heaven, and thou on earth.